All right, are you ready for our journey down the EC2 rabbit hole? Let's get started. Amazon EC2. Now, it was created back in 2006, and it was one of the foundational services that AWS released as part of introducing the platform. And in essence, it's just a service to run virtual machines. Now, over the years, there have been many different virtual machine types created for different purposes, and we'll talk about some of those in a bit. But as of right now, there's 700 different variations. So don't think you have to memorize all these variations. That's probably nearly impossible. But I'm going to show you what you need to know to be able to understand the name and the family of some of those different VM types. Now, in essence, those 700 different VM types just have different arrangements of various components of RAM, vCPU. Some of them also have GPU capabilities. Some are more optimized for compute workloads. Some are more optimized for network throughput or storage. And nowadays, we even have the option of physical systems that are not really VMs at all. So one can go out to the AWS website and go to the EC2 instance type explorer and just have a field day digging into each and every one of the different types of instances and use cases. But I'm going to give you a high level of how the families of virtual machines are broken down. Now all the instances have names and depending on what the name starts with tells us what AWS thinks the specialty or the optimization of that machine is. Now, if one of our instance types starts with an M, that's just a general purpose baseline instance. It's good for pretty much anything. If it starts with a T, that's a general purpose instance, but it's also burstable. And we'll talk about what burstable is in a second. If it starts with a C, it's compute optimized. That just means it probably has more vCPUs and probably less RAM than maybe a general purpose instance. If it starts with an R, that generally means it's memory optimized. In other words, it has more RAM and less vCPU. Now, if it starts with a G or a P, it's GPU optimized. And those are best for workloads like video transcoding and machine learning. And then we also have I, D, or H. And these tend to be storage optimized. They tend to have enhanced IOPS to EBS volumes. Now, back in the day, there were many people who were training on AWS that tried to come up with these mnemonics that we could memorize what all these things are. But that was way back in the day, and things have gotten way more complex nowadays. So, for instance, we have the Mac instance type. These are physical Mac machines. They're not VMs. So we can provision a physical Mac machine if we wanted to maybe compile something for iOS or a Mac operating system. We also have HPC, and this is for high-performance computing. Think like scientific simulations or weather simulations. We have the X systems, and these are really large memory. I'm talking about like terabytes of RAM. And these are made for in-memory databases like SAP HANA. Then we have a whole host of specialized instance types. VT for video transcoding. These have special Xilinx media cards that are really good at transcoding high resolution media very fast. Then we have the TRN or the INF. TRN for training, INF for inference. And these are optimized for machine learning training and inferences, meaning taking those machine learning models and spitting out predictions. We also have available to us field programmable gate arrays. And these are ultra specialized hardware that we can program that has a high degree of performance, but they're not as flexible as a CPU or a GPU. And then we also have these Z instance types, which are really all about just a pure high speed V CPU that can maintain that a very high gigahertz consistently. Okay, let's look at a name of an instance. What's in a name? So first of all, we have this M, and that M tells me that this is a general purpose instance. If you remember back to our chart, M is general purpose. We have seven, and seven tells me that this is the seventh generation. In other words, there was an M6, and they're still available is an M6. They're still available in M5, but I don't think there's an M4 because typically what AWS does is when they come out with a new revision or new generation, they end of life something that's several generations behind. We started with M1, M2, and so forth and so on. 
Now this I here tells me that this is an Intel based instance, meaning that it has an Intel CPU. And large is the relative size. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. We can go to a next example. And for this example, it's a general purpose seventh generation, but it has an A here. And that A may, means that it's an AMD processor. So instead of an Intel processor, it has an AMD processor. But because it says large, I know that it has the same specifications. In other words, the same vCPU and the same RAM as the other M7i large. So look at another one, M7G. This G means that this particular instance type has a Graviton processor. This is a CPU chip that's of Amazon's own creation. So a few years ago, they acquired a chip manufacturing company and put them to work creating this host of specialized chips. And I think they did this for a few different reasons. First, they didn't want to be so reliant on Intel and AMD for silicon. And second, I think they wanted to design some very specialized processors that better fit some of the unique use cases that customers were bringing to AWS. And these processors are used in a variety of services and platforms within the AWS ecosystem. Now, the thing to remember about Graviton processors is that they are an ARM processor. So it's not an x86 instruction set. It's an ARM instruction set. So you need to be sure that if you want to use these Graviton processors or these Graviton instances, that your software is compatible. Now, fortunately, there's plenty of Linux distributions and plenty of other software that does run on the ARM64 platform. And the benefit of running on Graviton versus AMD or Intel is that it's cheaper. So if you're looking to host some open source software like Nginx or something like that, that certainly will work on an ARM64 architecture. And that might work out in the end and save you some money. Okay, here we have three different instance types. We have an M7G large, an X large, and a 2X large. Now the large instance has two vCPUs and eight gig of RAM. Now the extra large has four CPUs and 16 gigabytes of RAM. The 2X large has two times that of the extra large. So it has eight vCPUs and 30 gigabytes of RAM. Now if we keep going up to, let's say eight X large, how many CPUs and RAM do you think that one has? Well, if you guess 32 vCPUs and 128 gigabytes of RAM, meaning eight times the extra large, then you would be right. Now we also have a metal instance type. And what does metal mean? Well, no, it doesn't mean that it can only host Iron Maiden concert footage or it sings like Cookie Monster. It means that we get access to the bare metal machine underneath. Okay, let's talk about burstable instances. And these are the instance types that begin with a T. At present, we have T2, T3, T3A, and T4G available to us. Now, if you had to guess, what would you say is the processor brand that is in the T3A? If you guessed AMD, you'd be right. And if you guessed that the T4G is an ARM64 architecture, then again, you'd be right there too. Now, how do burstable instances work? It's all about CPU credits. And as the machine is running, we accumulate credits, so long as the CPU is in an idle state. Now, when the CPU starts doing work, these credits get used up and they get depleted. And the way we can rebuild our credits is to just have the CPU be idle for a period of time, then that recharges our credits. Now, the trade-off is that these burstable instances cost much less than some of the other non-burstable instance types. So if our workload is this kind of spotty, uneven CPU demand, then using these burstable instance types can save us some big money. Now, what happens if we deplete all our credits? And this goes all the way down to zero. Well, we can determine what happens. We have two burstable modes. When we provision our burstable instance, we can choose between a standard or an unlimited mode. And if we choose the standard mode, once our credits go to zero, we're gonna be throttled. And so basically our CPU would go to zero until 
our credits build back up enough that we have enough credits to run our CPU properly. If, however, we have unlimited as our mode, we're going to pay for credits. If we run out of credits, then AWS is going to start charging our instance to add more credits to keep up with whatever workload we're trying to do. Now, here's the trade-off. If we're on, in unlimited mode, it's quite easy to rack up a bill that is way more than what we would pay if we were to use a non-burstable instance. So there's some calculus that you're gonna have to do and you have to know the behavior of your application and what the needs are to decide if burstable instances are right for you.